Alrighty, howdy folks. So chapter four, section two, uh, is what we're going to look at and it's on limits on continuity. Uh, somewhat of a, of a difficult section. I have a feeling, uh -oh. uh, hmm. I have a feeling um, mathematicians, mm -hmm. pure mathematicians could just focus on this section alone and and do all kinds of PhD research and and uh, work like that. It is it could potentially be that complicated. And uh, let me just try to give uh, a, an introduction uh, to and, and 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 as I do this, I will point out as to where that complexity comes from you will see that for yourself okay all right without much further ado let's get on so we're trying to define the limit for a multivariable function we all know about limit uh, uh, when it comes to just uh, in r2 right limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l sort of a thing for example hey what's limit of x square as x approaches 2 uh, simple man, 2 square, which is 4. Yep, you're right. But then I could make it just a tad complicated. For instance, if I if I asked you, what is limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x? And now you plug 0 for x and you go sine 0 over 0. Sine 0 is 0, 0 over 0, uh-oh, uh, 0 is over 0 is undefined. So what can you say about the limit? You cannot say, oh, limit does not exist. That may, that's, a, that's one of the possibilities. But you cannot automatically say just because when you plugged x equal to zero, you got a zero over zero, that the limit does not exist. That's a wrong conclusion to reach. And that's when we learned about that French guy. Who is that? El Hospital, uh, L'Hopital, right? The L'Hopital guy said, ah, if you bump into one of those situations where you got a zero over zero or infinity over infinity, then that's what is called an indeterminate form. And guess what you can do? You can take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom and then find the limit. And based on that, we're like, oh, really? Cool, man. Uh, so you mean derivative of sine x is cosine x and derivative of x is one? So limit of cosine x over one? As x approaches zero, yeah, which is cosine of zero is one. Hmm. I so don't know one that. over one, uh, one over one, and that limit is equal to one. So limit of sine x over x as x approaches zero turns out to be one, right? So we learned about all those kinds of things in Cal one, and now what we are planning to do is. A similar approach, but to a multivariable function. So what, what do we say? Let f be a function of two variables whose domain D includes points arbitrarily close to A, B. There is an ordered pair called A, B, just as in two dimensions we say as x approaches A. Here we'll take a slightly different uh, take, which is as x comma y approaches a comma b. Okay, what has that got to do with arbitrarily close? Well, back in the old limit thing, we have to say, let x be defined, uh, let f of x be defined everywhere in the neighborhood of a. There is a statement like that. When you're trying to find limit of f of x as x approaches a, what must happen is f must be defined in the neighborhood of a. Okay, and that means we can get we can let x get arbitrarily close to a. How close? As close as you want. What do you mean by as close as you want? Yeah, quite literally. As long as you don't let x equal a. You can get you can let x get as close to a as possible, and 
mathematicians typically use that and say arbitrarily close. So if we are letting, we are talking about a limit of a function, then that function be defined everywhere close to a, b. Okay, and why, why is that necessary? We'll see that in just a second. Then we say that the limit of f of x, y as x, y approaches a, b is L. Okay, and we write, this is, what, this is how we write that, limit as x, y approaches a, b. This ordered pair approaches this fixed uh, ordered pair of f of x, y is actually L. When can we say that? If for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that this thing, that looks a bit scary, right? Let's break it down and see what in the world this is saying. This is as simple as this. What, what should happen? For every epsilon, there must exist a delta such that some condition has to be satisfied. That condition is what is given here. What is that condition? X comma Y is in the domain. You must have X and Y in the domain. Otherwise, mm, forget about this. And what else should happen? Zero must be less than square root of X minus A, the quantity square plus what? quantity Y minus B square. And that should in turn be less than delta. What? Okay. What this is saying is, does the does the x minus a the quantity square plus y minus b the quantity square uh, remind you of something? Especially if I said this this thing the stuff inside the radical is equal to some r square if I were to say. Hey, that's the equation of a circle with the center a and b and radius r, man. Yeah, you're right. So when we say this is less than delta, what we are saying is the square, let's square both sides, ignore the zero part. Um, I'll get to the zero part in just a second. So if we say this square root is less than delta, then without the square root, I square both sides, x minus a the quantity square plus y minus b the quantity square should be less than delta square. What does that mean? That is simply the in, insides of a circle whose center is a comma b and radius is delta and zero less than this uh, that's a simply saying this square root must be bigger than zero okay square root of a quantity when we are talking about real numbers is definitely bigger than zero right uh, and of course uh, so that's the whole idea so the zero less than part is not such a big deal. It's sort of almost obvious. The other part, all it is saying is, if it is the case that you look at points inside this circle, which circle? Whose center is AB and radius is delta. If you look at all the points inside that circle, for uh, then the, with, with those x, y values, then it must so happen that the absolute value of f of x, y minus L must be less than epsilon. Uh, what is this? That means for every one of those points, in, please pay attention to this part. For every point inside that circle, if you look at f of x comma y, and that is a z value. So that f of x comma y value minus L, okay? And the absolute value of that must be less than epsilon. So we would say that this limit exists if for every epsilon you can find a radius delta such that all the points inside the circle with that radius delta center a b is such that the absolute value of f of x by y minus l would be less than whatever epsilon you pick 
This is the precise definition of limit for multivariable, for two variables at least, a function of two variables. Let me see if I can show that with a graph. So the domain is this whole thing. Mm, let's say the whole xy plane is the domain. That means this function actually is defined everywhere. So if our idea is to find the limit of this function as xy approaches a, b, that specific point, we have to have a circle around it with radius delta. And let's say our claim is, hey, limit of x, limit of f of xy as xy approaches a, b is actually some L. That means that particular z value. Then what must happen is for every point in this one, if we look at what the f of xy is, the maximum value of f of xy there must be L plus epsilon and the minimum value must be L minus epsilon. Okay, two things. Where the hell did this maximum should be equal to L plus epsilon? Where did I get that idea from? Ah, check this out. This absolute value inequal inequality is basically, if you were to rewrite this, it is saying L minus epsilon is less than F of XY, less than L plus epsilon. Let me repeat that. Maybe should I say this? Okay. Do you remember absolute value of X minus A? Maybe I'll put it so I'm sorry. Absolute value of x is less than a when we say. What that means is negative a is less than x, less than a. If we, if we apply that concept to this one, we should say negative epsilon is less than f of xy minus l is less than positive epsilon. And now if we add l to all of them, we get l minus epsilon less than f of xy less than l plus epsilon. In other words, f of xy must lie between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. What mathematician says, f of xy must be bounded between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. Those bounds are what are telling you what the minimum of f of xy should be and maximum should be. Cool? Now, uh, there was one point I wanted to mention. Boy. Yeah the, yeah, the two points was, one of them was about the absolute value and the second one is where we get the minimum and maximum from. Cool. So this is what must happen. Okay. Another point I want to mention is if you understood this, awesome. If you didn't, eh, don't sweat too much. And I have to point all of this out. This is a bit theoretical, I agree, but mm, it's interesting. Cool. All right, let's move on. Existence of a limit, of limit. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is the coolest thing. Uh, this is where the complexity starts to come in. So please pay attention to this. If f of xy approaches L1 as xy approaches AB along a path C1, what? f of xy approaches L1 as xy approaches AB along a path C1. You mean to tell me that there are different paths of approaching AB? Let's go back to this guy. Yeah, for example, would you agree to reach that point I could uh, even if we take things inside the circle. Can I start here and approach that point at this angle? Or could I approach it from that angle, this angle? Or even slightly more complicatedly, in a parabolic fashion, right? From here, I can come in a parabolic fashion and get there. Or I can come along a path that you can imagine a sinusoidal wave. Let's say it starts over here and I have a sine, sine wave and you can approach that point. So there are different ways 
of approaching this, there are different paths to approaching A, B. Right? So, uh, what is this saying? Let's say, by approaching it by one path along C1, we get a limit to be L1. However, if f of x, y approaches L2, as x, y approaches AB along a path C2, where L1 is not equal to L2, then we have to say the limit does not exist. Wait a minute, does that remind us of something back in Cal 1? Can you think of it? If you need to pause the video, think about it, that would be a great idea. What am I saying? I'm saying if we let, if we approach from two different paths, we get two different values for the limit, then we have to say the limit does not exist. That is precisely what we used to say in Cal 1 as left-hand limit is not equal to the right-hand limit, right? And if that is the case, we say the limit does not exist. That's the idea, a similar idea here. But the complication comes from there not being just a from the left and from the right. Boy, we can approach, we can let x, y approach a, b along an infinite number of paths. Right? That is what is going to lead to complexity. Let me, uh, I, I'll show you all of that. Cool. Uh, yeah, this is similar to the limit in single variable case, that if the left-hand limit does not equal the right-hand limit, then the limit does not exist. Okay, that's a version of that. Okay, um, definition. A function f of two variables is called continuous at a, b. Hmm. If you recall in Cal 1, this is what we did. The moment we talked about limits and understood exactly how all of that works, then we talked about continuity. And the definition of continuity is, uh, in, in Cal 1 was, uh, a function f is continuous at a if limit of f of x as x approaches a equals f of a. What is that? Continuous at A, if limit of f of x as x approaches A equals f of A. Can you guess as to what the definition here must be? A function f of two variables is called continuous at A, B if, I'm sure you guessed it, limit as, limit as x, y approaches A, B of f of x, y equals f of A comma B, then we say, the function is continuous at a, b, okay? Basically, when a function is continuous, in order to, uh -huh, pay, 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 whoa, 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 pay attention to this. The big deal about this continuity thing is, if we know that a function is continuous at a point, then to find the limit of the function at that point, we can get away with the simple substitution of a for x and b for y. That's why, hey, what is limit of x square as x approaches 2? x approaches 2. There's always this admonition, hey, uh, when you're taking a limit, you better not say x is equal to 2. x approaches 2 is what you should say. Right? Okay, oh, and, and you are scared and say, oh, you mean I cannot plug in x equals 2? Uh, and then what does the teacher do? Plugs x equals 2 in order to figure out the limit of x square as x approaches 2. I thought you just said x merely approaches 2, man, cannot equal 2, right? And the teacher comes and plugs in x equals 2. What gives? What gives is because x square is a continuous function, you can get away by simply evaluating the function's value at x equals 2. That turns out to be the limit. Precisely what similar thing is happening here. If you want to find limit of x, y, as uh, limit as x, y approaches a, b of f of x, y, just plug in x equals a, y equals b, provided 
f is continuous at this point a b cool we say f is continuous on the entire domain if f is continuous at every point in a b in the domain that's somewhat straightforward right once you know once you know about continuity at a point uh, what about continuity in a set of points where the set of points is is the entire domain well if it is con if the function is continuous at every point in the domain then the function is continuous in that entire interval or entire domain is the idea here cool all right let's see find the limit if it exists. Ah, now let's get on to some problems find the limit if it exists or show that the limit does not exist find a limit if it exists or show that the limit does not exist that's the way i should have read it uh, sometimes the foreigner in me who cannot speak proper english manifests cool uh, any idea limit as x y approaches to negative one check this out recognize that the function is a rational function is that true is that a rational function uh, do we have a, a polynomial over a polynomial yeah the it a polynomial in two variables right polynomials are continuous everywhere what about a rational function rational functions which are polynomial over polynomial are continuous everywhere in the domain if a point is in the domain then the function is continuous at, at that point let me repeat that if a function is continuous, if a, geez, if a point is in the domain of a rational function, then the function is continuous at that point. Again, the, why are we so concerned about this continuity? Uh, because we can now just apply, we can, in order to find the limit, we can just plug numbers. Oh, you want to find limit as x, y approaches 2 and negative 1? Plug x equals 2, y equals negative 1. Are you allowed to do that? Yeah, because 2, negative 1 happens to be in the domain of this function. How do you know 2, negative 1 is in this domain? A simple technique would be to plug 2 and negative 1 and see if you get something like division by 0 or 0 over 0. If that happens, you say, whoa, 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 that, that number is not in the domain or that ordered pair is not in the domain. So let's plug. Uh, so yeah, 2 square, negative 1, and it turns out, nope, there is nothing like division by 0 or 0 over 0 or infinity or something like that. So it's just a nice number, negative two thirds. So guess what, folks? We're done. That's how you find the limit of this. Cool. Now let's look at another one. Find the limit if it exists. So show that the limit does not exist. Limit as x y approaches three two of e raised to square root of two x minus y. Is an exponential function continuous everywhere? Yeah, e to the x, that's continuous everywhere. Oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, does that mean this should, well, we have a square root, right? Can we take the square root of a negative number, especially if we are forcing that things be real? No, so the only restriction comes from the, the square root. So as long as 2x minus y is greater than uh, or equal to 0, we are okay. So all those points such that 2x minus y is greater than or equal to 0 are in the domain of this function, uh, in this uh, domain of this e to the square root of 2x minus y, and continuous at all those points. So is 3, 2, one such point where 2x minus y is greater than 0? Let's plug. Uh, 2 times 3 is 6, 6 minus 2 is 4. 
yeah, 2x minus 4 is clearly greater than, uh, uh, did I say figure out 4, uh, 2, 3, 6, not 4, yeah, 4 is clearly greater than 0, so yeah, 3, 2 is in the domain of this function and continuous. So guess what, folks? Uh, it's an exponential from 2x minus 5, yeah, yeah, so, okay, that's what. So e to the square root of 4, which is positive 2. What? Square root of 4 is just 2? No, man. My high school teacher said square root of 4 is plus or minus 2. No. Square root of 4 is absolute value of 2, which in turn is equal to 2. So that's the only value. Square root of 4 is just 2, not plus or minus 2. Okay, so this is just e square. Straightforward. Did I say something like these limits are very complicated? Pfft, I must be an idiot, right? Mm. Check this out. Find the limit if it exists or show that the limit does not exist. Oh, uh, cosine square x. Is that defined everywhere? Cosine x. Yep. Uh, y to the 4. Yeah, defined everywhere. x to the 4 plus y to the 4. Yeah, fine. Can x to the 4 plus y to the 4 ever be 0 for any real numbers? Nah. Huh. So, uh, let's go ahead and plug 0, 0, man. Uh, good. So, 5 times 0, cosine square 0, cosine 0 is 1. So, 1 square, oh, the top became 0 and the bottom became 0. <coughs> Uh-oh. We got 0 over 0. Oh, okay. Limit does not exist. No, 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 no. Don't say that. Right? It, that may be true, but we don't, we don't know. Uh, what is that? Recognize that this is not in the domain since we get a 0 over 0, right? We didn't know initially. That's why we just simply plugged in and see and, and saw what would happen. And we got 0 over 0. And based on that, we should say, uh-oh, uh, this point is not, 0, 0 is not in the domain. But this does not automatically mean we cannot find the limit. Okay? So, uh, ooh. Interesting. I'm trying to. I think I, with you being sophisticated calculus three students, I could have gotten away by saying, "Hey, remember the L'Hopital's rule." But looks like I decided to come up with a simple example from Cal One. Uh, can we find the limit? Okay, plug x equals one. One minus one is zero. Zero over zero. Uh oh, zero. Oh, okay. Uh, there are two ways, right? You, we could apply L'Hopital. Take the derivative of the top, you get 2x. The derivative of the bottom is 1. So 2x, now plug, oh, you get x equals 2. Or else, what could we do? Um, we could do this manipulation. Hey, I'm going to write x square minus 1 as x plus 1 times x minus 1. And now x minus 1, I can cancel them. Can I? Can I cancel x minus 1 and x minus 1? Yeah, man. Uh, a times b over b. You can cancel the b and make it equal to a. Uh, not so fast. What if b is 0? Huh. Dang. How come you always come up with all these things, man? I thought you can just simply calcul cancel x minus 1. And now you tell me I can't do that under some conditions. You make my life hell, man. I'm sorry. So seriously, though, yeah, you cannot cancel x minus 1 uh, from the top and the bottom like that and say that's equal to 1 if x minus 1 is 0. But that's exactly what I seem to have done. I cancelled x minus 1. That is because limit as x approaches 1 we are guaranteed, we are guaranteeing that we will merely let x approach 1 and not equal 1. 
and because of that we can cancel this we are guaranteed that this would not be zero that's why we are canceling it cool and limit as x and we get limit of x plus one as x approaches one how do we f f uh, find this limit oh plug x equals one uh, you are a liar man you just said x cannot be equal to one you promised but now you're plugging x equals one mm, check that out right the thing is yes it is still true that i cannot let x equal one when we are talking about limit as x approaches one i cannot let x equal one however i can provided this is continuous with the idea being if it is continuous whatever limit you find by simply evaluating this function x plus one at x equals one that is what the limit turns out to be okay if i'm not looking at limit hey tell me what is f of one if f of x is x plus one oh that is two oh guess what limit of x plus one as x approaches one will turn out to be precisely the same as f of one and that's what we are doing here cool i got many more things i need to cover man <coughs> um so in our case what we should do is find the limit as x y approaches zero zero via different paths and that sure poses a problem really now ladies and gentlemen slap yourselves on the face and wake up we are on to some kind of a rad if the approach is along the x-axis that is y equals zero we find that the limit equals zero what really hmm let's see what am I talking about? If we, would you agree about this part? If the approach is along the x-axis, aren't things every point on the x-axis, do they not have the characteristic that y is zero? Yeah, so basically that is y equals zero. Let's look at this guy. What happens when y is zero? Oh, the top becomes zero and the bottom becomes x to the 4 0 over x to the 4 so notice we are letting x y approach x act approach z oh jeez uh, we are letting x approach 0 we have already established that y is strictly 0 end of the story but with re with regards to x x is taking on all kinds of values and getting closer and closer to zero x is approaching zero that means x is taking on a value of 1 0 0.1 0 0.01 0 0.001 and so on right well the top is zero over x to the four and x is not necessarily zero x is not approaching zero right x is not equal to zero i meant to say so x is merely approaching zero for zero over some non-zero quantity has to be zero that's why i'm saying we find that the limit equals zero precisely because of that so so much thought went into that right now um, i think next i'm going to say if the approach is along the y-axis that means x is zero i know the answer but let me not show that to you and let's think through what is this we are saying uh, if the approach is along the y-axis that is x is equal to zero cool let's examine what happens x is zero the denominator simply becomes y to the four cosine square zero oh that's just one would you agree so what what has happened to this this has become five y to the four divided by y to the four so it is tantamount to our evaluating limit as y approaches zero of 
5 y to the 4 over y to the 4. Oh, wait a minute. We can cancel the y to the 4 and y to the 4 because y is merely approaching 0 but not equal to 0. So that reduces to 5. And guess what? The limit is actually 5. What is it that you guys do? Poof. Right? The limit as x and y approaches 0, 0 along the x-axis, we get a limit of 0. But approaching from along the y-axis, we get a different limit, 5. Guess what? Because of that, we have to say the limit does not exist. But don't tell me, oh, limit does not exist because you get 0 over 0. No, 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 no. It is because... If we let x, y approach 0, 0 from different paths, we get different values of limits. Cool? So this is the slight complication. Slight. Yeah, that's a euphemism. This is the complication of limits here. <clears throat> and maybe I should, yeah, maybe this is a good time to point that out. When we were dealing with space curves, right? Three dimensions and all this stuff, curves, parametric curves. Yeah, that was limit was pretty straightforward. A limit as t approaches zero of some r of t. Mm, absolutely no issues, but limits are not so straightforward here. You see that? And that's why we reverse the way we cover stuff in one dimension, in r2 and r3. Okay, uh, find the limit uh, y square sine square x over x to the 4 plus y to the 4. Okay, um, what's the standard uh, thing? Okay, plug x equals 0, y equals 0, uh, 0 times 0 on the top, which is 0, 0 plus 0, uh, that's 0. Ah, 0 over 0. Uh, so let's uh, try different paths. Okay. y equals 0 along x-axis. So what is it that we need to do? Uh, plug y equals 0. So the top became 0 and the bottom became x to the 4. So 0 over x to the 4 as x approaches 0. Mm, that is 0. So that's that. Find the limit and the limit equals 0. What about uh, along the y-axis? Oh, cool. Let's do that. That means x equals 0. Let's walk through this one, folks. So along the y-axis means x equals 0. Let's plug x equal to 0. So the top becomes 0 and the bottom becomes 0 plus y to the 4. Or 0 over y to the 4. Would you agree? If we plug x equals 0, the top becomes 0 and the bottom becomes y to the 4. So we have 0 over y to the 4, and we are saying y will approach 0. So that means 0 over y to the 4. That limit is also equal to 0. Absolutely no questions about this, right? If the approach is along, then we find the limit equal to 0. Luckily, ooh, luckily, what's luck got to do with this? If the approach is along the y-axis, x equals 0, we find that the limit equals 0. All right, mom, dad, we found the limit to be 0 in two different paths. Therefore, the limit is 0. Uh, not so fast. Oh, come on, man. Um, <clears throat> check this out. We need to check other paths as well, really. For instance, if the approach is along the line y equals x. What? Yeah, just because you approach along the x-axis, along the y-axis, that's not enough. Let me show you what happens if we approach along the y equals x line. That's a perfectly valid approach, right? What happens to this? 
Mm, okay, y equals x line. Does that mean I can replace a y with an x? Yeah, you can. So make it x square sine square x over x to the 4 plus another x to the 4. That's the idea. y square sine square x. This is what we need to find. So let's it whole, the whole thing changes to a limit as x approaches 0 of x square sine square x over x to the 4 plus x to the 4. What's that equal to? Oh, just plug x equal to 0, man. Oh, yeah, good. Um, <coughs> 0 uh, over 0. Uh-oh. Love it all? Yeah, we could, but uh, let's see. Couldn't we write this as, uh, this is x to the 4 plus x to 2x to the 4, x square over 2x to the 4. Doesn't that simplify to 1 over 2x square? Can I yank that one half outside? So 1 half, limit as x approaches 0, sine square x over x square is what this becomes. What is that? Oh, that's equal to 0 over 0. L'Hopital? Yeah, you could apply L'Hopital. But if you... Rec let's be clever about it a, a bit. Can I say that? sine square x over x square is sine x over x, the quantity square. So what? Then, I don't think I wrote this. The limits, the laws of limits allow us to do something at this stage. You want to find the limit of f of x, the quantity square. You can take the limit of f of x and then square it. So that means in this context, we can find limit of sine x over x, and then whatever we get, we can square it. That's perfectly valid. Limit laws allow us to do that. Why? Because it's so much easier. If you want to apply lop at all to this, just the sine x over x, you get cosine x over one. Cosine zero is one, one over one. So limit of sine x over x is straightforward. Otherwise, if you had sine square x, you'll have to take the derivative of this. There's a 2 sine x cosine x over 2x, sine x cosine x over x. Uh, again, you get 0 over 0. Again, you have to do sine x times cosine x, the derivative, product rule, blah, blah. That's a pain. Instead, if you recognize this, then this is 1 half times 1, and that's equal to 1 half. More importantly, that darn thing is not equal to zero. What does it mean? Even though we approve, when we approached along the x-axis, we got zero, and which is exactly the same as what we got along y-axis. If we approach it, if we approach zero zero via via the y equals x line, we get a different stupid limit. So, thus the limit does not exist. <laughs> this shows how painful the process of determining a limit is. What's that American expression? You ain't seen nothing yet. Right? Okay. Ah. Uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> really, this is very, very painful. And, and uh, how to intuitively figure out how, yeah, 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 yeah. How the hell did I know to approach along y equals x line? That's, that's the thing about this stupid thing. You have to develop an intuitive idea about this, right? Or, of course, look at a solutions manual and see what they did, and you go, aha, right? But uh, let's see. There is perhaps a slightly interesting way of doing this. We will learn an interesting technique. Transform the function to polar coordinates. The book does not teach you this one. 
Um, so let's see. What's that? Oh, you just transforming Cartesian to polar, you know, right? X equals R cosine theta, Y equals R sine theta. That's what you substitute and change. This substitution allows us to treat X comma Y is zero, zero as a simpler, as a simple R equals zero and leave theta as a variable. Okay. X comma Y equals zero, zero. Uh, if we say R equals zero, then theta can be anything as a variable, which is equivalent to showing that allowing an approach via any angle, because theta is a variable, that means by choosing different values of theta, we are approaching, we are, we are approaching zero, zero via different angles. The y equals x is a 45 degree angle or negative 45 degree angle or uh, no, uh, sorry, take that back. 45 plus 180, 225 degree from the positive x axis. So this approach, if we had solved this problem by plugging x equals y, uh, x equals uh, r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta, we could have solved it. Let's see. So what did I do? I picked that y square sine square x and uh, da, 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 sine square of r cosine theta, all of this. And <clears throat> what happened? We got sine square theta times sine, okay, instead of sine square of r cosine theta, I'm writing that as sine of r cosine theta. And I took this r square from here Okay, and combined it with the sine square here. And so we have sine of r cosine theta over r. So just rewriting it, some manipulation here. So one more thing I wanted to show was limit, yeah, limit of sine p over p as p approaches zero equals one, lop it all, right? So if you look at this limit of sine of r cosine theta over r as r approaches zero, as such, we get sine zero over zero and we should not say mm, that's, equal, that's this thing. So I'm, I'm rewriting this as sine of r cosine theta over r cosine theta times cosine theta. What am I doing? I'm both multiplying by cosine theta and dividing by cosine theta. Why did I do that? Because I wanted to make the argument of sine the same as the denominator. The argument of sine and the denominator, I wanted it to be the same so that this kind of looks like sine of alpha over alpha. Well, if r approaches zero, does r cosine theta also approach zero? provided, you know, theta can be anything for all values of theta. Yeah, so that means this is almost like evaluating this limit is saying limit as alpha approaches zero of sine alpha over alpha, which according to this, or maybe I should have said P, come on, Sammy, uh, sine P over P, that's it, is one. And cosine of theta, Ooh, I goofed. Samuel, that's not equal to one. Uh, shucks. Escape, uh, let me, yeah, let me pause this guy. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Uh, so this part, just that part, limit would uh, become equal to cosine theta. But uh, then we are left with sine square theta, that sine square theta, the limit of that would be cosine theta over cosine to the four theta plus sine to the four theta, right? Um, 
Okay, so what, man? Well, would you agree if we change theta for different theta values, this would have a different, uh, th this quantity would be different? Try something, for example, theta equals zero. Well, theta equals zero, uh, we have the top to be zero and the bottom is one, zero over one. Theta is zero. Wait, isn't that the same thing as approaching along the x-axis? Yeah, did we get limit to be zero there? Yeah, that's exactly what this says too. Okay, how about that y-axis thing, man? Okay, approaching along y-axis, that means what? Theta is pi half. Okay, pi half or 90 degrees, whichever you're comfortable with. So let's let this approach that way. Sine square of pi half is one, cosine of pi half is zero. Oh, that's zero on the top over sine, this is zero plus one. So zero over one, that is zero. However, y equals x, that corresponds to theta equals pi fourths. So sine square of pi fourths, pi fourth uh, sine of pi fourths, square root of two over two. So that means uh, this would be sine square pi fourths is one half. One half, this is square root of two over two. Oh boy, one half square root of two over two. So square root of two over four and, and so on. So if you figure this out, yeah, plug uh, pi fourths and figure it out. Mm. Sine square pi fourths, is that a simpler way? Yeah, that is a simpler way. So, this is square root of two over two cube on the top, and the bottom is square root of two over two to the power of four because cosine of pi fourths and sine pi fourths are the same, we have that square root of two over two, okay, one over, so this becomes one over square root of two over two, or two over square root of two, which is square root of two. That's what I think it should be. What did it come out to be in the previous one? Uh, Where am I, man? Yeah, one half. Yeah, along the y equals x, I get one half. Maybe I, I goofed on uh, some of my uh, thing. Uh, that should be, that should come out to be the same thing. Okay, um, if we approach by theta uh, equals pi fourths direction. Okay, sorry about that. Where are we? So, this shows that since approaching via different theta values, uh, directions, we get different value for this quantity, we have to say the limit does not exist. Let's pick this guy. Um, plug x equals r cosine theta. Um, let's try that strategy out. And uh, we get r to the five cosine theta, sine to the four theta, da, 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 and that reduces to this one. So what should we find the limit of? Limit as r approaches zero, right? So what happens as r approaches zero? Well, the top goes to zero and the bottom, as long as the bottom is not zero, well, cosine to the four theta plus sine to the four theta, will that ever equal uh, zero? So in general, we notice that, yep, this actually does approach zero. Now, thus, we can say sort of limit of this thing, but I don't know. I'm not so sure about that though. Mm, am I not? Nope, that's okay. 
I think I think we are okay. So in this case, yes, we can say this. Okay, let's move on to. Ooh, almost same, but not quite same. Okay, x y to the four over x square plus y to the eight. So I felt so confident. Hey, yeah. Uh, man, this polar stuff is really good. Um, x axis set y equal to zero. But this problem is not so straightforward with the polar method. Hmm. Okay. Uh, if we approach along the x axis, that is set y equal to zero, we get the limit equals zero. However, we approach along the curve x equals y to the 4, right? x equals y to the 4. What happens? x equals y to the 4. So the top, would you agree, y to the 4 times y to the 4 is y to the 8. And x, x is y to the 4. So y to the 4 square is y to the 8. So y to the 8 plus y to the 8. 2y to the 8. We got y to the 8 on the top, 2y to the 8 on the bottom, so that becomes 1 half. So, this darn thing, if we let x approach, uh, if we let this approach along x equals y to the 4, that curve, the limit is 1 half not equal to what we would have gotten by approaching along x-axis. <clears throat> Since the limits are not equal, the limit does not exist. Ah. You know what happened? I... Ah. When you get a bad result, you don't publish it. That's what people say. I did something like that. I said, yeah, this polar coordinate method is really cool, man. And I plugged uh, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. And there I was getting something and I was all excited. Yay, this works. It's... And I find out, nope, what I got was wrong. So I didn't even publish it. Maybe you, you, you try that uh, x equals r cosine theta method and see what happens. But anyways, so... Uh, this stuff is hair pulling. That's why I was saying real mathematicians who are into water <clears throat> topology and something called functional analysis, those areas, they live on this kind of stuff. But as long as we get a decent idea of what the complication is and we are able to recognize uh, the continuity if the function is continuous at a point, man, it's um, it's easy to find a limit and what to do, just a simple plugin. If you understand that concept and if you understand some of these things, how to do these problems, you have learned a pretty decent amount, okay? Don't let that intimidate you. I know it is intimidating, but please try not to let it intimidate you. Solve a few problems like this and if if uh, if it is up to me, I won't try to complicate things much okay, in a test or something like that. If you understood the kind of problems I did, I'm a happy man. All right, folks, that's it. Adios.